we have what could be, well, it cer- certainly could be an historic result. It's an historic election. It's the first time we've had a woman at the top of the ticket in a major political party in the history of this country. Hillary Clinton representing the Democrats. I know it's not official yet, but it's going to happen. And then that the raises the possibilities of what might be um, an historic first ladyship. It's not going to be the first lady if she is elected. In addition to that, what kind of a first lady might we have if Melania Trump becomes the first lady. So we're going to delve into that with our guest, Andrew Oak. Andrew is the author of Unusual for Their Time on the Road with America's First Ladies. I have volume one in my hand. He's in the studio with us. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Tim. How are you today? I was looking at your picture. You've got the suit on and everything like that in your picture. You're not like that at all, though. Sure. A little bit of, uh, you know, it's funny. I do the public appearances and the public uh, speaking and Mm -hmm. and, uh, at presidential museums and libraries. And a lot of times you look out in the crowd and people kind of tilt their head like a dog hearing a a high whistle. I would not be who I would cast in a movie as a uh, first lady's historian or or Mm -hmm. women's historian. uh, And it's just, you know, the the C-SPAN series that I produced with a great team of people over at C-SPAN. Mark Farkas, I know a friend of yours from this show. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was very fortunate to be the producer on that series that got to travel to all these locations and get to know these first ladies in a different kind of way. How'd you get involved in, I mean, interested in this? I mean, you got the tats, you play drums, we were just talking about that. I mean, you don't have what one would consider the typical resume of of an historian. No, you know, I like stories. Mm -hmm. I like to tell stories and I like to document stories. Mm -hmm. And when friends of mine at C-SPAN told me about the project and the fact that many of these stories were yet untold or unfamiliar to the public in mass, you mm-hmm. know, to bring these kind of things to the light and talk about a group that's, you know, very underrepresented in American history, women, and and how they helped build this country. It just was so intriguing to me. And the rigorous schedule to put that show on the air and travel to these locations, I come out the backside of this thing kind of like a rain man of first ladies. And mm-hmm. I just the facts just keep coming and coming and the stories and they were so great I figured I'd start talking about them and write a book about it what's the harder ones to do the ones who were years ago or the ones who were more contemporary um that's an interesting question because I can't peg one or the other. Clearly, when you go back in time, there's not the documentation that you would think. Um, We don't have them on film. We don't even have some of them on camera, obviously, before photography. And later on, we kind of get a little more protective of things, and you don't get to see as many things. So Mm -hmm. it really depends on the first lady. Like, it might be harder to go and find out really, really in-depth things about Hillary Clinton where you could go to Martha Washington and find out more, even though we had less documentation of her because of the way modern times and, and media has, has depicted them. I was reminded uh, that you have in here one of the chapters on uh, on Louisa Adams, John Quincy Adams' wife, and, and uh, Louisa uh, Thomas, who is the daughter of Evan Thomas, just came out with a book, and I talked to her a couple of weeks ago about Louisa uh, Adams and the amount of diaries and the letters, the correspondence, something you don't get nowadays. On the other hand... You do get a lot of video appearances, but all of that seems really controlled. And so you wonder, always wonder exactly what you're getting for the real picture, you know? That's exactly the point, Tim. And if you go back, like a lot of these letters and the Louisa Catherine Adams diaries mm-hmm. are a perfect example. We're not meant to read those right. when they're writing them. And Louisa Catherine Adams documents her travels across Europe with John Quincy. She, you mentioned uh, the, the Trump administration, the potential Trump administration. That would be our second only foreign-born first lady, Mm -hmm. Louisa Catherine Adams, the only foreign-born first lady. But when you get into these documents and you get into these diaries and these letters, you get to learn things about these women that there's no way you could learn in the controlled modern times that we live in. All right, let's talk a little bit about this this one key, I think, intriguing prospect, which is what happens not only if you have a first guy, Mm -hmm. but he's also... Uh, former president. I mean that that that's a double whammy. I mean, aside from a first a former president being filling that role, it's and you know and a man filling that role, it's a former president. So what does this do? Absolutely. I mean, we can only speculate that it would be Madam President if Hillary Clinton mm-hmm. or any woman were to get into the office eventually. I mean, we have to think that that would happen sooner than than, sure. than later. So you then have a first gentleman. We could presume as well. First guy. First guy. And people always ask me in these speeches and stuff, well, are you the first man's lady man or what happens to Mm -hmm. that point? I'll always be the first lady's man. But this is the most unusual, as you've pointed out, in a former president. So in addressing these two, if the Clintons were to get back into the White House, you would have Madam and Mr. President. Mm -hmm. And when you say that to people, you kind of see a light go off and they think, oh, I really didn't think about that. So a lot of the traditional roles that the first ladies hold, like ambassadors and and hosts and, and receptions and things like that, Bill's been through there. 
He's done it before. He's no shrinking violet. He wouldn't take on a back seat, I don't think. So it would be very interesting to see what happens. But you also know that, that first ladies traditionally entertain and keep the company of other first spouses. Mm-hmm. So that's a dynamic. When other male leaders come here and sort of hand their wives over to Bill to right. go on a tour or go out to lunch or do whatever while the executives speak about the regular business. And then does does Bill put his tuxedo next to the first lady's dresses in the Smithsonian? I mean, it just it really opens up a whole new world of possibilities for I've us. already decided, by the way, the references in the news will be President Hill and President Bill, so that we've got it easily taken care of. Instead of saying Mrs. President Clinton and Mr. President Clinton or President Bill and Hillary all the time would just be President Hill and President Bill. It's sort of like 41 and 43. Absolutely. That's how we refer to them. So I'm just using the, the news shorthand. Uh, once again, Andrew Oak is with us. Uh, the book, by the way, unusual for their time, On the Road with America's First Ladies. So, uh, I mean, th- given the idea that this is this is one of the other parts of it. It's not just about the f- official titles and so on. Mm-hmm. But first ladies, if you go back to say Eleanor Roosevelt, who kind of redefined the first lady, sure. and she was her husband's legs, as she said. Absolutely. Um, and Hillary Clinton, pretty activist. Jackie Kennedy, in her own way, but a presidency that is also now um, accompanied by a first mate, if you will, who is going to be a former president. You'd have to think you have to be careful about being outshone by or somehow misinterpreted as the person making policy. I mean, Ellen Roosevelt, probably one of the most powerful first ladies in history. Let's face Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Longest sitting. Yeah. for And and she was, as she said, she was her re- husband's representative around the country. But she forced policy in a lot of cases. I don't know what that would mean for a Bill Clinton because he's seen as somebody who was the president. And while he's not, quote unquote, making policy, he's sort of like back in the policy-making machine again. So how do you strike that balance, I guess? And how does a former first lady now strike that? You know, it, it, it is very interesting to think about. And as I mentioned, Bill Clinton, President Clinton, no shrinking violet. It's going to be hard when some leaders that are the same for countries that dealt with uh, President Bill Clinton, who are now dealing with President Hillary Clinton, and you walk into the room, who gets the first handshake? Who mm-hmm. steps forward? Uh, when I, I would imagine that in a Clinton administration, just based on when she was a senator, they weren't in the same room a lot. She would go places and do things, and he would go places and do things. I think Bill could potentially pass, surpass any of the other well-traveled first ladies like Mrs. Nixon, Mrs. Bush, Mrs. Clinton, Mrs. Obama. And and he could do more outreach and more stuff outside of the White House than putting the two of them in the same room. You, they're, they're very strong personalities, and you put the two of them in the same room, and you're going to have conflict of some sort, even if it's just the guest not knowing which Clinton you're dealing with. How much of a first lady's correspondence and her activities are considered not classified, but confidential, and there is a certain time period after the presidency in which they are kept quiet until they decide to add them to the presidential library, and how much is hers? In other words, a president's correspondence as president is going into, it's owned by the public ever since Richard Nixon. So what about the first lady? How much of her stuff is owned, if you will, by the people? And, And in the case of a former president, does his stuff, does it get treated differently? As as far as what we do with our first ladies post presidency and mm-hmm. even even pre presidency, do you know that this year is the first time they've ever had a White House transition office for the first lady? They've never had that transition. That you know, they, the the administration sort of the handover notes mm-hmm. and they set up that office to get right. everyone sort of acclimated. Thing there hasn't been one for the first lady up until this year. They also why now. I, you know, I really don't Nobody know. Nobody ever thought of it? I or? really don't know. Yeah. It's, it, the, the role continues to grow. And you mentioned Eleanor Roosevelt, the legs of her husband. Eleanor Roosevelt had to do that because she wanted to, when, when, the, when the post, uh, when, the, um, when the marital affairs came mm-hmm. out, before FDR gets uh, polio, he's a mama's boy. Mm-hmm. Sarah Roosevelt is running the house. Through a, Eleanor Roosevelt didn't even have a seat at her own dining room table at Springwood uh, uh, along the Hudson up there in, in north uh, upstate New York. Mm-hmm. So she wants to get a divorce. Sarah Roosevelt says, no, you're not going to get divorced. We don't do that. Roosevelt's don't do that. There's too much money at stake. There's too much everything else at stake. So they stay married. But she says, I'm done with my marital duties. I'll stay married. But, you know, hands off and we're going to sleep in separate bedrooms, all the other kind of things like that. 
So Sarah Roosevelt is very happy for her son just to stay and be this rich guy, uh, lord of the manor, and take care of things. And Eleanor Roosevelt sees if she does that, then she's really stuck. So she's the one that hires a political consultant, the guy that lived in Bethesda down here, to resurrect his president or his political career, get him to be president, and then she steps out beyond that. So she makes her own gateway to get out from under her husband, mm-hmm. under her mother-in-law, and get out and do this to become what we say is you know one of the most influential first ladies, whether you like what she did or didn't like what she did, she was there for a long time and did sure. a lot of stuff. She couldn't have done that if Lucy Hayes hadn't done it years and years and years and years and years before for her husband, Rutherford B. Hayes, when he was governor of Ohio. She went to insane asylums. She went to uh, orphanages, hospitals, things like that, and brought back that sort of recon information for her then governor husband that would transfer into the White House. So there's transformative women and transitional women. And as the role builds over years, we've discovered the importance of it as Americans. And then you get these transitional offices. It's, it's, it's amazing that it hasn't been done before. I can only imagine, too, in the case of uh, Donald Trump, where Melania is now trying to, you know, he was talking about how she's a successful businesswoman. There was a rather uncomplimentary uh, article recently in a magazine about her. Mm-hmm. And it kind of portrayed her as a little bit of a bubblehead, if mm-hmm. you will. And there's a language problem. As you mentioned, she was born in another country. On the other hand, she would be the first lady. And so there is a deference that you have to pay to that individual. And clearly would get caught up in this whole Washington, like, what's your cause? I mean, Michelle Obama, I thought, pretty much put herself, her life on hold to become first lady. I mean, right. she did a lot of things. She was a member of the board of directors. She was accomplished, but she became first lady, which meant that goes away. I'm going to be mom to my girls right. in Washington, keep them you know, on the straight and narrow, but she sort of put her life on hold. Case of Bill Clinton, a little different. I'm not sure what Melania Trump holds. And if she, she, she is pretty much taking care of the family right now, and that's I don't know that she has any causes or anything. The, I, I don't know of any current causes. She'll definitely have to pick one up, you know, whether it's literacy as the Bushes did or let's move and, you know, child obesity or whatever sort of direction she's going to go in. It could be women's rights uh, in a more international flavor because Mm -hmm. she's got that international uh, element to her. But she will take on a role that has been shared by many other first ladies in that she's young and beautiful. And whether we like the presidents or not, those first ladies always get a, a, a pretty good deal in the press. You can go back to Francis Cleveland, the youngest first lady in history at 21 years old when she married Grover Cleveland, who was 49. The country absolutely went crazy for it. Harriet Lane, James Buchanan, the only other bachelor president to be elected to the presidency who didn't remarry, but his niece, Harriet Lane, who comes in, young, attractive, wore different kind of styles, uh, um, uh, remarkably low cut uh, um, necklines and things like that, and hairstyles, updos. Heaven forbid. Oh, uh, well, yeah, you know, you, c- you couldn't see her ankles, but you can see down past her neck. I mean, but, but the public responds. They see these women, and just like you say, Whatever we think about Melania, uh, uh, Bubblehead, this, that, and the other, articles, model, Trump wife, you know, she is going to be in that position. She is going to be one of the most highly visible women in the world. And people are going to pay attention to her shoes, her hair, her makeup, her styles, and her causes. And she will be pushed in that direction because modern day first ladies can't not have a cause. Well, we will see come 260, 56 days from today, whenever that person is who takes the oath of office, who will be standing beside him or her to be the next first person next to the president. Andrew Oak, for those who are looking for it, unusual for their time on the road with America's First Ladies. This I have in my hand is volume one. So this is available where? where This is available at firstladiesman.com. Okay. My My store page there will take you to either getting a signed copy directly from me uh, hardback, paperback, e-readers are on the way. You can also get it at Amazon.com, BooksAmillion.com, Barnes & Noble, and uh, any live event that you might uh, happen to get to. And make sure you get it so you can get the picture with uh, the with Millard Fillmore. It's actually a cardboard cutout. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had fun on the road. YouTube posing, yes. A one-sided conversation, I'm imagining, with the cardboard cutout. Yeah, he was a little flat. <laughs> okay. Flat Stanley in real life. All right. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me in. Cool. It's great. Andrew Oak, author, joining us here on POTUS. And by the way, the uh, the Twitter handle is at First Ladies AO, at First Ladies AO.